Welcome to the HBM Test and Measurement FAQ video series. Hi, I'm Bart Morick, HBM Applications Engineer. And in this video, I'm going to provide a short presentation on how to calculate the maximum permissible effective bridge excitation voltage of a strain gauge and what has to be taken into account in an actual application. Looking at our strain gauge catalog, you will see a lot of information on the specifications of each gauge. We provide information on the orientation, the dimension of the package, the resistance, grid size, etc. One of the specifications that is overlooked and is not well understood is the maximum permissible bridge excitation voltage. In this video, we will explain this and describe how it is calculated and what you need to consider when applying excitation voltage to your gauges. Calculating the maximum permissible excitation voltage for a strain gauge is sometimes required. The data sheet included with a strain gauge will often include a suggested excitation voltage, but this value is based on a typical material and that may not match up with the material you are using. A strain gauge is basically a little heater. There is current flowing through a resistor. We will discuss the factors that determine the amount of heat generated. Then we will go through the math to determine the amount of excitation voltage based on the size of the gauge and its resistance and the thermal conductivity of the material the gauge is attached to. Finally, we'll go through a couple of examples and conclude our presentation. A strain gauge can be seen as a heating element. According to Ohm's law, the power through the strain gauge can be defined as the excitation voltage squared divided by the resistance of the gauge. That being said, there are two ways to decrease the power through the gauge. Decrease the excitation voltage or increase the resistance of the gauge. The grid foil on a strain gauge is very thin, 4 to 5 micrometers in most cases. With the power going through the gauge, that power in the form of heat needs to be dissipated or the gauge could burn up. There are three ways to get rid of this heat. The heat in the gauge can be assimilated through the measurement body, it can be dissipated through the gauge carrier, and it can be discharged through the air, although this offers a very limited amount of cooling. Excessive heat on the gauge can manifest itself with a zero drift on the gauge. If the amount of heat generated is excessive, the gauge could run into self-compensated issues and perhaps cause other issues such as exceeding the adhesive temperature limit. To limit this, you can choose a higher resistance gauge as higher resistance produces lower heat. You can increase the physical size of the grid as the larger area allows for better heat dissipation. You could also change the measuring body by using a different test material to allow a better thermal conductivity, but that obviously isn't possible in most cases. You can also avoid some issues by not using special gauges like stack rosette, which have more difficulty in dissipating heat. As you can see here, gauges with the same physical size can have much different excitation voltages. In this case, both gauges have a grid size of 3 millimeters, but because the resistance is different, 120 ohms versus 350 ohms, the excitation voltage can differ from 3.5 to 9 volts. In the same manner, here we have two gauges with the same resistance, 120 ohms, but different grid sizes, 3 millimeters versus 150 millimeters. The larger area in the 150 millimeter grid size allows the excitation voltage to increase from 3.5 volts to 25 volts. The heat flow model can be calculated by knowing a few items. The measuring grid area from the data sheet, the thermal conductivity or lambda of the material gauge it is attached to, the temperature gradient, and the resistance of the strain gauge. So the maximum excitation voltage recommended can be calculated by taking the square root of the resistance times the area of the gauge times the thermal conductivity of the material it will be attached to times the temperature gradient. The table in our specifications assumes a couple of things. Number one, that the thermal conductivity of the material is based on steel. And number two, the temperature gradient value is limited so that the change is less than or equal to one micrometer per meter at room temperature. This table is a list of the different style of strain gauges that we use where the CTE is matched to the material it is attached to. The thermal conductivity or lambda of each material is shown. The excitation voltage correction factor can be calculated to know what the proper excitation voltage limit may be in your specific case. For example, if you're using stainless steel instead of ferritic steel, 
You can multiply the maximum excitation value of your gauge by 0.55 to come up with the proper maximum excitation voltage for stainless. The correction factor is calculated by taking the lambda of the material you are attached to divided by the lambda of steel and taking the square root value of that. So to conclude, we discussed the fact that a strain gauge is an electrical resistor with a loss of power. The heat generated must be discharged in some manner. Excessive heat can cause measurement errors seen as zero drift. The maximum excitation voltage applied can be calculated using certain known parameters. And when using certain materials such as composites or plastics, you should either use a lower excitation voltage or choose a larger strain gauge. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, please feel free to call, email, or visit our website for the latest product solutions and downloads at www.hbm.com.